Jews Citizens Forum. This is being filmed on Tuesday, June the 18th. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking our great volunteer crew and the Shaw staff who make all of this happen. Thank you all very much. Um, the first part of Citizens Forum is always the Walter and Jack show, and we're going to start off. Walter, last week uh, there was a story on CFAX Radio in the morning, uh, exactly one week ago today, June 11th, that a barrel of nuclear waste had washed up somewhere on the BC coast from the nuclear disaster of Fukushima. And until today, so one week later, I never heard another word about that story. Today I heard that it has, it, somebody had decided it was not nuclear waste and therefore there is no story and so the whole <coughs> thing is gone. Now. I've seen that kind of thing happen before where some official from the government comes along and says, no, that's not whatever, and the story, there is no story. But if anybody knows anything more about this, um, and we don't know what the truth is. I mean, it was reported that a barrel of nuclear waste had washed up and had been found on the coast of BC. If anybody knows anything about it, please get in touch with us. So the email address here is jet. K-I-N-O at yahoo.ca. So that's, uh, and, and you've got sort of a similar thing. Well, this is all about. attached. Everything is connected, isn't it? Um, um, Will uh, sent me uh, a website talking about the debris. I just started getting curious about the debris washing out from Japan. 20 million tons of debris, of household appliances, cars, Houses, docks, boats, um, whatever you see. Barrels, cans. Whatever you see in the city now wash up the sea. 20 million tons of, of floating debris. Is that what they think is going to hit our, co that amount <coughs> is going to hit our, the coast of Well, according North to this America. site, most of this stuff will eventually sink. But lighter objects will, will, will float and, and will eventually travel all over the Pacific Ocean. Now, if it was just debris, uh, it would be an environmental issue. Uh, but now we also have to realize that it, this debris could be contaminated with radioactive waste and radioactive particles. So looking at all this material floating on the ocean, some of which is contaminated, uh, it's, that, that is now an environmental catastrophe. And um, be just because our authorities choose not to talk about it doesn't change the reality of it. The other thing I was looking at, because I was curious, was uh, looking at this, this LNG deal that, that's been announced very recently by Christy Clark. And, and uh, the deal, of course, is, has to be approved by the federal government. And with a little bit of uh, reading, you realize that the deal was approved last year by the Harper regime, and they took flack from, from it because they allowed two major deals to be done. One with, was with uh, the Chinese oil uh, entity, I don't know the name of that company, and this Malaysian uh, national oil company called Petronas. So those, both of those deals were, were approved by Harper. And then he said, we're not gonna make any more deals like this from now on because he knew that we're entering into some really dangerous territory when we start signing agreements, uh, not just with foreign corporations, but now with foreign governments, giving them you know, preferential treatment, allowing them to bring in their own workers, allowing lower wages to be paid, all sorts of um, issues around that. And also, when you get tied into a government with it with an arrangement you know all of a sudden it becomes much more of a political issue and much harder to solve these problems if problems arise for instance if there's a massive oil spill or uh, whatever so that was the other thing that i was reading this morning very early and then i realized that uh one of the reasons why there is this demand for natural gas is because of Fukushima, because the Japanese government has shut down all their reactors. I think they have around 50 some reactors in, in Japan. They turned them all off. And they seem to, seem to be surviving quite well, but they're burning liquefied natural gas or want to move more and more to that. So there's a demand for liquefied natural gas in Japan, and they're paying 
kind of world market prices for it right now, and uh, it's a pretty good buck, but that's going to change very, very rapidly, and they've already announced that they're not going to be uh, purchasing at that price level for very long. Uh, the problem is that Canada and uh, the, the government here in British Columbia are all, you know, just can't believe their great luck that they're going to be creating, you know, servicing this new, this new market that by the time this is all up and running, that the cost of the pr what they're paying for natural gas could drop drastically, could drop 50 or 60 percent, no problem. Well, I guess that's the goal of the corporations that want to use the natural gas, Yeah, is that it should be as cheap as possible. So you want to create as many suppliers as you possibly can. That's right. And uh, there are suppliers all over the world. But to me, I, the economics of this is one thing, and I'm sure in the end, as always happens, or seems to happen more and more recently, the public will pay and the private sector will benefit. Yeah. Uh, but to me, the environmental issue of natural gas is, is so bad that for Christ, I mean, Christy Clark brags about it. The NDP supports all the natural gas. The media always talks about it as if it's a good thing because it's going to bring in money. But the environmental disaster of fracking for natural gas, as well as burning it now, because we know that we're already over the cliff in That's terms right. of climate change. It, the disaster is growing and is to some extent unstoppable. So to pretend that all of this is great, and you know, you walk around outside and you see that the people who run our country have created the most inefficient, wasteful, expensive, catastrophic transportation system that could ever be devised, and that's what we've got, and we can't change it. A friend just returned from a, a trip in Germany and some of the other northern European countries. He said the public transit is great, lots of people are on bikes, and there's many fewer cars yeah. on the road and the rail system is superb yeah no I when I was in Europe I was always so amazed that would be saying oh how are you going to get here and there and well you walk down to the train station uh, oh you've missed the train you think it's a problem no well, there's another one in nine minutes and it's going in the very same direction and people are just constantly loading onto these trains and uh, they're super super fast at one point I was I thought, I wonder why all the cars on the highway were stopped and, and, and we were going by. Then I realized that we were traveling like three times as fast as the highway speed. So watching out from the window of the train. It looked like it the cars on the highway were stopped. Yeah. It was an optical illusion. Canada is, is becoming, uh, our reputation is being trapped. Uh, I mean, our reputation is being destroyed by what we're doing around the world. And Stephen Harper is a big part of it. The media is a big part of it. Our political, our undemocratic political system is a big part of it. You know, they're always bragging 60% of all the world's mining is headquartered in Canada. I mean, I, I've heard that over, as if that's a good thing. Well, the reason the world's mining corporations are headquartered in Canada is because we have the worst laws in, in, in the Western world. So they can, they can commit the horrible acts that they commit around the world, and if they're in Canada, they're untouchable. Yeah. How about telling us that? How about telling us the truth sometimes, Mr. Media and Mr. Politician? Well, also, I mean, the Alberta is, is in the red right now. You know, and we said this before, how do you do this right in the middle of a boom time, be running a deficit? What do you think it's going to look like if they have a major fluctuation in oil prices or something depresses the market? You know, they're already giving the store away. And now uh, we're not salting any, any money away. We're not salting any reserves away. Uh, British Columbia is looking to Alberta and thinking that's a great model. Let's get in on the deal. Let's get a liquefied natural gas. And we don't know what it's going to cost to get this infrastructure really up and running, what it's going to cost the taxpayers. But the citizens, if you don't mind. The citizens. And, and, you know, we really don't know what that all is going to mean in the end for us, what, what we're going to pay. And you can, all, you can guarantee, Jack, 
we're going to pay a lot. And if it was just the money, that would be one thing, but the environmental damage is something that we really cannot afford to do. We can do better. We can use less, and we have to. We can't continue this completely wasteful way of life. I think we can use less and have better communities, better lives, and, and be happier people, because where they're taking us, I mean, People are strung out, stressed it's out. Not, it, does, it doesn't match up with reality either. This is projected demand. In Ontario, the, the consumption of electricity is dropping around 2 or 3% per year. While the population is growing, Good. while industry is growing, uh, the, the energy consumption is, is naturally dropping because of e efficiencies and, and awareness of how to use uh, machinery and just, just companies taking... Uh, control of, of uh, their destiny and that's going to continue on well into the future so really and truly we can have a growing economy if this if everybody has to have that um, and still reduce our energy consumption drastically by the way you know Japan turned off all their nuclear power plants and they're not suffering brownouts or blackouts they're still able to meet their electricity demand and the same thing here in British Columbia I think we're way, way over on, on production of what we need to produce, particularly for domestic use. And uh, yeah. we're generating a lot of electricity to give away at a very low price to the Americans right now. And it really isn't fair when, when uh, we have to pay such high rates here in British Columbia. So the question is, how do we move ahead in a positive way? And as I, I guess what what I make my theme on the show is we need a media that is telling us the truth about what's going on and also focuses on positive things like what you saw in Europe and, and what my friend yeah. just back there saw. We never hear that. There are a lot of great things going on, not only in Europe, but in many, many other places around the world, Asia, South America. There's great things happening. We Canadians deserve to hear about these things from our media so we can emulate them. Instead, the media is filled with, really, what do they give us? More than anything else, crime and violence. They love crime and violence, and they fill the media with crime and violence, yeah. the news, uh, which, which I think quite deliberately has very negative impacts on all of us, individually and as a society. Yeah. Uh, I think it's... You know, unfortunately, we're talking about reality, and unreality is not a pleasant thing. And, uh, you know, what got us into this hole? Uh, you know, we have to point out some people have been steering the ship and it's going into the rocks. That's the unfortunate thing that's happening right now. In the provincial uh, government right now, we have a, one of the worst situations you could ever possible have is you have the, the, the ruling party and the opposition all in agreement on major issues on how to take this province apart, how to destroy the province. The thing is, is that the NDP were getting all ready to be in office and they were learning all their lines on how to defend the terrible things BC Hydro was doing, the crazy bookkeeping of the provincial government. Uh, they were willing to promote liquefied natural gas and forget about all the environmental costs. They were just right on the bandwagon and then they woke up in the morning and realized they weren't in the government. So they have no credibility. They can't come back now and start criticizing the government on these key issues. So we're really in a bad spot here. You know, I'm a member of the NDP, and I think the membership of the party has got to retake control of the party. And I, I'll say the same thing about the Liberal Party. Oh, yeah. You know, there's lots and lots and lots of great people who are members of the Liberal Party. And I think in many ways, they want the same as those of us on the, uh, on the political left want. I think we want a good society. We want a prosperous society. And, and we want honest decision making. Let's know what works and, and let's move in that direction. But both parties are run by professional politicians who have become members of the elite, who don't seem to work for us, the citizens, anymore. And I think the memberships of the party have got to democratize the party so the grassroots begins to have power 
and, and the citizens as a whole begin well, to ask And how about the MLAs have a little bit of courage? I mean, they've internalized that they're powerless. The MLAs believe that. They can't even go to their own leader, let alone to the, to the, to the government, uh, and ask for changes. They're all, they're all cowed by, by the executive of government and all that. There's, there's programs and policies that they're being told about, and they say, okay, you guys sell this for us, but it doesn't come from the grassroots, it doesn't come from the people, and the MLAs are powerless, and, and it's just, and they truly believe that themselves. That's why we just don't get anything done. And they're very comfortable too. MLAs <laughs> make, you know, what, $100,000 a year, or something like that. I, I hear there's a nice pension plan. In many ways, it's a good job. And, you know, if you're in a safe riding, which many of our MLAs are, uh, you know, the, the things are good. You don't rock the boat. But it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for us. But, you know, the NDP do need a leadership convention. They have to really seriously look at not only Adrian Dix and others that have been. That, you know, been steering the, the policies and everything like that. There's no doubt they have to have a leadership convention. They have to look at all these major policies. They do have to clean house a little bit. They've been going in the wrong direction. Now, I'm not like, I want to save the NDP. I want to save the province. We have to have an opposition party in, in the legislature that's going to be bringing up these issues. We just don't have anybody there right now. The sooner the NDP gets their house in order, start realizing that they can take these progressive issues on again and represent the people again, then they'll get some credibility and perhaps they might be able to win an election next time. I think the problem is that the current leadership of the NDP is not that kind of person. So I'd like to see the party democratize more, that yeah. the decision making comes from below. You know, we've got to start moving in that direction because the current direction is obviously not working at all. No, not at all. And I think we're really stuck in a bad place in the next few months, next couple of years, if they don't make changes. And that the party is really looking at becoming irrelevant. And I think that's why they didn't win the, uh, the election, is because they became irrelevant. Hard thing for them to accept. But they wouldn't take on the hard issues, the burning, burning issues around the smart meter issue, reviewing how the HST happened, looking at the whole BC Rail scandal and all that stuff. This the is deficit. The deficit. I mean, take the deficit. The fact of the matter is that the deficit exists only because of tax cuts put in place by the Liberal government. Those tax cuts are now costing about six and a half billion dollars a year, and the cuts went disproportionately to the one percent and the biggest corporations, okay? That was the cause of the deficit. To run an entire election with the NDP yeah. never mentioning that fact, when schools are being cut, healthcare is being cut, public sector workers, thousands of them in the biggest unions are not making a living wage, the, uh, the liberals say we can't pay you because we have a deficit, and the NDP doesn't even mention, like, Hello, why do we have a deficit? They won't even say it. That is the pathetic state the NDP is in right now. Really, yeah. And, and the media is, is well, worse. But that's what happened to them, Jack. Like, they were preparing to be the next government. They thought, oh, we can't take these issues on too seriously because we're going to have to defend all these policies to stay in power. Basically, that was their idea. Well, guess what? They didn't win the election. So now where are they? They don't have any policies. They have no. They have nothing, other than just the being the little uh, poor cousins of the Liberal Party and sort of tagging along. So you're suggesting that they somehow the party begins to represent the people. Exactly. You know the NDP still there's a there's a strong social democratic movement in in, in in Canada and in British Columbia. It's still alive and well. Believe it or not. I've always been a social democrat. I've always believed in protecting the environment, and 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 you can't you can't you can't you know separate the environmental issues and social issues. They're just one one and the same. They're inextricably linked. There's still a very powerful sentiment in British Columbia for people that want to have a fair government and all these other things, and all the NDP has to do is tap into it and quit ignoring it. Get rid of those smart, smarty pants guys at the top that think they know everything. 
I've had enough of that crowd. And they really do. They really rankle me to think that they can hijack a party. A lot of these people aren't even elected. They're just uh, advisors. And they're telling the MLAs and everybody else how, this, how it's going to go. Just get rid of that crowd. Get back to basic politics. Play everything straight. Everything straight up report to the media exactly what they want to do and they become so popular had they done that they would have rode a wave into into the legislature they would have won it with a majority no problem but no they didn't I, they, they had haven't learned their lesson if they don't do it before the next election they could disappear themselves as a party because they really don't have anything going for them right now if they're going to continue off in the path they're on right now yeah, so uh, things are, uh, this, this segment is almost out of time. We've got one minute left. Um, it's, you know, it's like the bottom of the ninth in terms of, of our society, our economy, and the planet. We've got to do the right thing. It's up to all of us. Uh, thank you for watching The Walter and Jack Show. Thank you, Walter. Pleasure, Jack. Hey.